Welcome to the Guide Exile. Have you just been getting hounded by enemies lately? Can't keep those pesky things from hitting on you all the time? Always scratching and working their way to you no matter what you do? Well, then concern yourself no more, as I have researched and theorycrafted the perfect build to keep them at bay. It is the boyfriend block- I, I mean the, uh, the blade flurry block gladiator. The main goal of this build was to utilize the gladiator ascendancy for its powerful block bonuses as one of our main defensive layers, and to make use of the wonderful bleed explosions. The general bonuses from this ascendancy, along with the tree pathing options, leave us open to many skill and build options, making for a flexible and good league starting character. I will discuss the Blade Flurry variant within this guide, since it has strong damage and allows us to make use of a unique claw called the Blood Seeker. With Blade Flurry, we alternate weapons, so we will use this claw in one of our weapon slots to gain a mix of regular and instant leech, without having to take Vol Pact. If you are on a budget, you can of course make use of two of these claws. But I advise using a stronger claw in your main hand, such as the all-powerful Scourge Terra Claw, or a rare Crit Claw. Now let's get into the specifics of the build. The Blade Flurry Block Gladiator makes for a solid League starting character as it is able to start from inexpensive uniques and rare items and scale up to complete all of the endgame content, including farming Uberlab if that is your thing. Offensively, we make use of this skill Blade Flurry. This is a very powerful skill that excels at single target and has respectable clearing potential. As mentioned in the introduction, we will be dual wielding for its passive bonuses of 10% more attack speed, 15% chance to block, and 20% more physical attack damage. Since we are making use of claws, we will be mainly scaling our damage through critical strikes and critical multiplier. With our ascendancy, we will be able to passively generate frenzy charges for more damage and attack speed. We also gain bleed and bleed explosions from our ascendancy to assist with our damage coverage and clear speed. Finally, we make use of the auras Herald of Ash and Hatred for some utility and extra added elemental damage. Defensively, we make use of some layered defenses. Our first layer of defense is Evasion. Now I'm usually not a fan of evasion, but it can be very strong when paired with other layers of defense. We get our evasion chance from gear, as well as applying blind and enfeeble to our targets, making them very unlikely to hit us. Our second layer is attack and spell block. If our evasion fails, we will then roll to completely block the incoming attack. In this build variation, we can have anywhere between 56% chance to block attacks, and 64% chance to block spells, to 72% chance to block attacks, and 78% chance to block spells, depending on our gearing and ascendancy conditionals. However, even being above 50% block chance is very strong. Our third layer is mitigation, which consists of armor that we gain from flasks, endurance charges that we generate from our ascendancy and enduring cry, the enfeeble curse that we apply to targets, and finally fortify. This ensures that if we do end up taking a hit, we will perform some sort of mitigation on it. Now on top of all these layers, we also make use of Instant Life Leech from our Bloodseeker Claw to quickly recover any health that we may lose from taking hits that make it through all of our layers. And being that we are not taking Vault Pact, we can also benefit from passive life regeneration. The playstyle of this character is very quick and mobile. We make use of a Whirling Blades to quickly navigate maps and trigger our Fortify. For regular packs of monsters, we are able to quickly flurry them down and watch them explode. For bosses, we drop our Warchief Totem to apply Blind and Cull as we flurry them down. On bosses, you will want to make sure that you charge up to 6 stages of Blade Flurry, which is signified by the mark over your head and written in the buff bar, and then release to deal massive damage. Since we are using Ruthless, every third full channel of Blade Flurry we perform will be overcharged. For extended fights such as Guardians or Shaper, you will make use of a Frenzy to maintain your Frenzy charges, simply hitting the target once about every 15 seconds. The passive trees and path of building pace bin are included within the description. Some pros of the build include, it is a very quick and engaging playstyle. You have many defensive layers to make mapping very safe. It has very impressive single target damage. It can run most all map modifiers. For no leech and fizz reflect, you will require some different gearing to ensure that you have the proper defenses, and for elemental reflect, you will just have to turn off your auras. And finally, we have bleed explosions for clearing and of course, more gore. Some cons of the build, RNG can be very punishing sometimes, and our evasion and block can and will fail at certain points. Our class and ascendancy choice is the Duelist Gladiator. This is a solid all-around class with access to defensive and offensive options. Pain Forged grants us damage if we have not taken a hit, and increased block chance if we have. Versatile Combatant applies all of our attack block chance to spell block chance. This is a very strong node, as you generally need to itemize perfectly to get proper spell block, but here we get it for one point in our ascendancy. Gratuitous Violence provides us the ability to apply bleeding, increase damage against bleeding targets, and 
bleeding enemies will explode for 10% of their maximum life. These are the bleed explosions that will greatly assist in your clear speed. Finally, Outmatch and Outlast will provide you passive frenzy and endurance charge generation while mapping. Since we are using a skill that alternate weapons, we will be consistently generating both of these charge types. For Ascendancy progression, I would follow this order. Here is the complete endgame passive tree. Defensively, we are picking up Life, Evasion, Block, Chance, as well as Life and Mana Leech from the Soul Raker Claw node. Offensively, we pick up Weapon Damage nodes, Critical Strike Chance, Critical Multiplier, Frenzy Charges, and Jewel Sockets. I would recommend the following tree progression into the final tree. For Bandits, we are going to be helping Alira for the plus 15% All Elemental Resistance and 20% Critical Multiplier. This helps out our gearing and helps us scale our Critical Strikes. Some useful pantheons for the build include Soul of the Brine King, for avoiding any chain stuns while we are channeling, Soul of Yugal, for reducing the amount of reflected damage taken if you choose to run reflected maps, Soul of Tukahama, for more mitigation as well as passive life regeneration when we are fighting bosses. Here are the following gem links for the build. Support gem links are shown in order of importance. For your main links, you will want to be making use of increased area of effect while mapping, and concentrated effect on bosses as needed. For your sixth link, the strongest link is damage on full life, which is quite easy to maintain with instant leech. However, if you are going to be in a situation where you can't stay on full life reliably or do not feel comfortable with it, you can swap it for chance to bleed. Of course, our obligatory movement skill with attached fortify. For this link setup, you have a couple of options. It can be mainly used as a passive method for applying an offensive curse and generating power charges with Repost, Vengeance, Curse on Hit, and Assassin's Mark, a passive way of applying Blind and Culling Strike with Repost, Vengeance, Blind, and Culling Strike, a passive way of generating power charges with Cast One Damage Taken, Blade Vortex, Power Charge on Crit, and Increased Critical Strikes, or a manual way of doing both with Orb of Storms, Power Charge on Crit, Curse on Hit, and Assassin's Mark. Any of these options are viable, but I recommend using the Blade Vortex method, since you would rather have the dangerous monsters be cursed with Enfeeble, and this will help you gain power charges while your Warchief applies Blind and Culling Strike. These gems do not need to be linked, they are just supports. These are placed in a 4 socket rather than a weapon 3 socket, as I wanted the ability to weapon swap to a Bright Beak for Leap Slamming for Labyrinth Farming without disengaging my auras. This setup provides utility for dangerous monsters and bosses, applying blind and performing culling strikes. A 3 or 4 link warchief totem would provide decent damage, but we do not really need to rely on this damage to complete boss encounters, and would rather opt for more defense and utility. If you choose to use a Scourge Terror Claw, I would recommend socketing these gems in it, as the summoned wolves will now be supported by blind and culling strike, making them somewhat useful. This provides passive defense and offense. I do not use Immortal Call, as I prefer the consistency of Endurance Charge mitigation, however you can use it if you would like. There is no required unique gear to be able to start this build, however there are many useful uniques. Here are the uniques that I use. Bloodseeker. As stated before, this provides us instant leech from any hits made with this weapon. Using even just one of these claws results in very strong instant leech. Scourge Terror Claw. This is a very strong unique claw that provides good base damage, critical strike chance, and 70% global increased damage. Belly of the Beast. This chest helps us fill out more increased maximum life, which we generally lack on the right side of the tree. However, a well-rolled rare chest work just fine as well. Red Blade Tramplers. These boots provide a decent life roll, Resistance, movement speed, and flat physical damage to attacks. A solid all-around choice for offensive boots. Here are other optional uniques. Bringer of Rain. This is a solid pseudo-7 link that you can use in the beginning of a league before you have a 5 or 6 link chest piece. Carcass Jack. This is a great offensive chest that provides some life, resistances, area of effect, and evasion. You will have to get 4 off colors, however. Blood Grip Amulet. This is a great amulet with physical damage, life, and percentage life regeneration. A great choice if you are running labyrinths. The Anvil. This amulet provides a lot of defense through armor, block chance, and life gained on block. If you feel the need to get closer to block cap or want more tankiness, you can make use of this amulet. Bisco's Collar. Remaining a law-abiding citizen, 
This build is crafted such that you can use Abisko's Collar to get the most returns while you are mapping. For rare gear, you will be looking for evasion-based gear. Here are the affixes that we want to look out for on gear, along with all of the rare gear that was used on my character. There are only a few requirements of your rare gear. For your helmet, jewelry, and belt, you will want to look to get intelligence and strength rolls where possible to help fill out these stat deficits as we are on the right side of the tree and do not get many of these. Accuracy. You want to get at least 250 total flat accuracy on your gloves, jewelry, or helmet. Since we have a heavy dexterity investment, we do not need as much flat accuracy on gear. This is so that you are above 85% chance to hit, as we do not have resolute technique. Of course, as always, I like to aim for 90% plus chance to hit, as it makes our hits and critical strikes occur without much fail. For your helmet, you will want to look out for a 40% blade flurry damage. For your boots, getting the 16% increased attack and cast speed if you killed recently is a very nice bonus for mapping. As for corruption, the main one to look out for is a plus one maximum frenzy charges on boots. This is because we make consistent use of frenzy charges. For flasks, using a recovery flask is optional. Outside of lab, I generally do not use a life flask. If you do choose to use one, you will want to have at least a divine or eternal life flask. For utility flasks, you will want to make use of the following. A diamond flask. This helps increase our effective critical strike chance, smoothening out our critical strikes. Silver flask. This provides more attack speed and movement speed to help speed up our clearing and time to reach max blade flurry stages. Here are the unique flasks that I use and recommend. At Ziri's Promise. This flask provides a welcomed damage bonus as well as some more life leech from the chaos damage we deal. A great overall cheap flask. Lion's Roar. This provides a massive melee damage bonus but unfortunately adds knockback to our attacks. This flask is really only needed on bosses. And luckily endgame bosses such as Guardians or Shaper cannot be knocked back. Rumi's Concoction. This flask is highly recommended for this build as it fills out a good portion of your block chance. Prioritize getting a well rolled version of this flask. Both Lion's Roar and Rumi's effects will work together, but you will only get one of the Granite Flask effects. Leveling this build is very straightforward, but as always there are many leveling uniques that make the experience much faster, easier, and more fun. These uniques are the following. Elrion minus mana cost jewelry is very useful until you can make use of a Thief's Torment. I highly recommend using this ring as it provides excellent life and mana sustain for your blade flurry and life pool. It also allows you to reserve almost all your mana during leveling. Without either of these, you will need a mana flask. Since we do not get our main skill blade flurry until level 28, we will be leveling with a few different skills until then. For your gem progression, I would recommend the following. At level 1, you'll want to get cleave, socketed with onslaught and chance to bleed. At level 4, grab an ancestral protector. At level 10, You'll want to socket cleave with maim and chance to bleed, as well as get a leap slam. At level 12, you'll want to get sunder and link that with maim and chance to bleed. By level 18, you'll want to have your herald of ash and get your sunder linked with maim, chance to bleed, and melee physical damage. At level 24, you will want to get hatred. At level 28, you will finally be able to use blade flurry, and you'll want to link that with melee physical damage, maim, and chance to bleed. You will also get an ancestral war chief, which you can link with melee physical damage, maim, and chance to bleed to help out your single target damage until later in the game. From here you will just need to fill out the rest of your supporting gem links and auxiliary gems as you level. You can also swap to a whirling blades once you swap into blade flurry. Now of course feel free to make use of the passive tree and gear to help fill out missing attributes as you level and respect them later once you have appropriate gear. Make sure to use defensive flasks such as jade, stibnite, and or granite while leveling to smoothen out your missing or weak gear. Here are some possible build variations. I will not discuss the versions in complete, but will provide a summary and a paste bin for the path of building code. A crit sword blade flurry block gladiator. This variation of the build simply makes use of two swords rather than claws. This allows us to get more block chance by making use of the unique Skava swords and sword nodes. However, we will have to grab the life and mana leech nodes below the duelist, and we will lose the instant leech that we had from the bloodseeker. Crit cleave block gladiator. This variation of the build takes the same tree adjustments as the previous variation. 
but we now instead use Cleave as our main skill of choice. This is not only because Cleave deals respectable damage, but also has a very powerful unique threshold jewel, Overwhelming Odds, which provides area of effect and free fortified to our Cleave. This makes us more reliably tanky and able to have a respectable area of effect. Now these are just a few of the near infinite variations you can make on this base. I will let you decide on how you may want to tweak the build further. The Gladiator Ascendancy really lends itself nicely to an all-around performer. It provides excellent defense and offensive bonuses that can help out with all different variations of attack-based builds. It provides excellent defensive and offensive bonuses that can help out all different variations of attack-based builds. With this build variation, we get a very powerful League starting character that can scale efficiently into all endgame content with many different variations. The multiple layers of defense really make this a comfortable mapping character, being able to shrug off all those gnarly map modifiers and nagging monsters that try so hard to get at you. As always, thanks for watching, and I'll see you in the next one, Exile.